this film made a lot of money. Not a, not like the most incredible sold better. Finding Nemo sold better, and Monsters Inc. sold better. But that would put this at the one, two, three, fourth, number fourth slot for Pixar so far. Four hundred and forty-two million net income, which is nuts. Putting it above Toy Story two, Toy Story one, and Bugs Life. Lots and lots of success there, and it's no re it's no wonder why. While there's lots of methods and paths to success, Pixar's approach usually seems to be do the best we can to craft the best possible product, and then it will speak for itself. The fact that they already have the reputation for that kind of quality helps, because it's like a Star Wars film, or at least how a Star Wars film used to be. A Star Wars film is going to sell, right? Obviously, that is not always true. Looking at you, Solo, which we covered earlier this year. And that's why that whole proper support thing kind of comes into it as well. Like I said, there's there's no rule for financial success, but it's nice to see something good have this kind of financial success. I also always find it fascinating to really go through and analyze how storytelling works. I, I find it helps my own storytelling and, and just analyzing other works. Because we start off with this alien planet and these floating cities... But that's dumb. So why don't we just stick with the floating city? But that's not interesting. So why don't we add balloons to it? Okay, but what, what's the point of the balloons there? Well, how don't we have a contrast? A big, bright, happy balloon with... Uh, what's a good contrast? How about a dour old man? Ooh, that's a good idea. Now we need the old man to commit suicide. Okay, perfect. Wait, hang on, that might be a little bit too dark. Why don't we come up with him going on a trip with his floating house? Okay. If we go on the floating trip, we have to figure out why. That necessitates the whole backstory for, you know, going to Paradise Falls things. But you know what? He has no impetus for change. He's just, at that point, the story is just he's taking a trip down there. He gets there at the end. So we, we need some kind of catalyst to alter things. Ooh, how about we have a kid involved? And that'll be the thing to help push him into changing and being a different person. And then we add in the dog. And you just kind of see how the story develops over time. It's fascinating to look at. As usual, Pixar did their massive amount of research that they are well known for. Um, they went on multiple locations to look at the the animals, the trees, and the terrain to figure out all that fun stuff. And they also studied elderly, older people, to figure out exactly how they move and how they animate. And with that information, they'd established a series of rules for animating Carl. He could only be animated in certain manners. Now, that was important because... You've probably never even noticed that. But now that I've pointed it out, you're probably thinking, oh, yeah. Because he does animate in a way like an elderly person would. Like he has pain and, and difficulty and his joints don't work quite the same way, right? Funny thing, they also changed his dialogue to, to approximate this as well. Lots of shorter words. Like they'd write out a sentence. You know, this is the intent of the thing. This is, this is a, a good way to do dialogue, by the way. You write the sentence in the first draft version, and then if you're various uh, X-Men films, you just make that go into script. But what you should actually do is you look at that and say, okay, who's speaking this? And then you rearrange the words a little bit, and you change some of the words, and you replace them, and you change the punctuation. And basically, you alter the specific sentence to fit the tone of the person saying it. So you start with intent, and then you end with a sentence, something actual spoken. And, of course, this is something I have given as advice many, many times. You say it out loud, because words, sentences, dialogue, literally, 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 is processed differently if you're reading it than if it's spoken and you're hearing it. So you say it out loud to see how it sounds and see if it works coming out of the mouth of a human being. So they did this with him, a lot of consonants and a lot of shorter words. So he came across as terse and perfunctory, which is good stuff. This is what I mean by Pixar really, really showing their craft, really polishing their films, unless it's Cars 3, in order to try and make them as good as they possibly can be. At the beginning of the film, he, we have the narration for the, the thing, and it kind of shows the impetus for becoming an adventurer. Cool. Lots of things can catch the imag imagination of kids. I can think of many things that have caught my imagination when I was young. And then he goes out, and he, he's got the narrator playing over him. And you can tell the narrator's in his head as he's... Did you ever do that? I did. I've actually told this story before. Back in school, there was a, was a playground area, and there's one, one part where the playground basically stopped being pavement and started being just rocky, arid dirt, because I grew up in Southern California for the most part. And while there's certainly nice terrain down there, there was a whole lot of arid and a whole lot of cake and a whole lot of dirt. 
cakey, you know, like mud or clay or whatever. So there's just this section out there. I called it the Badlands. And I would go out there and I would just play in there and I'd just, I would be silent the whole time because it's all in my head. You know, but I'd wander around and move things around. I actually played war games on that specifically, narrating the stories, you know. I'm pretty sure I looked very weird. I always did it by myself. No one ever came over. I even had friends at that particular school. It just kind of reminded me of that. <laughs> um, we also see Ellie and Carl as children, which is good. It's good, and it's a good way to establish things. See, the film, near as I can tell, and I've heard a lot about this, so forgive me for throwing all that out the window and just doing my own analysis, but from what I've heard from behind-the-scenes perspective, the film was crafted and then they tacked on the intro to establish investment. Now, when I say crafted, I don't mean like they finished the film and said, we need an intro. No, I mean like they had roughed out all of the story elements that I mentioned earlier, and they're like, you know, it needs something else. Then the intro came in. We see them as kids. We see the motivation. We see the why. We also establish like an absolute closet full of Chekhov's guns, but let's not go into that. This leads into Married Life. It's the name of the, the sequence. It is 4 minutes and 14 seconds long. 254 seconds of some of the best filmmaking I have ever seen. The amount of time and effort they spent on these 254 seconds is mind-boggling. The, oh God, the camera usage, the visual elements, the animation, the color usage, the lighting approach, the way that they did this music. This was uh, Michael Giacchino from back in The Incredibles. By this point, you know, The Incredibles had come out, and he, he has now a star, and he's now a big uh, film composer, and he does some absolutely amazing stuff. He reportedly really poured his soul into this bit and god it shows and i'm actually tearing up god damn it i'm actually tearing up okay real talk real talk before i analyze this sequence for real by the way a third of my notes on this page are just for this sequence no joke before i really dig into analyzing this sucker how many of you cried at it no shame First time I ever saw this film, uh, it was pretty close to when it came out. It was on it was on DVD or Blu-ray at this point. I was watching it with my sister, and I still remember it because I died. Oh my God, I I I sobbed so hard. We had to pause the film. Almost didn't finish watching it. I'll mention that in a minute. Um, yeah, it was just oh, and I she had to talk me into finishing to wa finishing watching it. It was just. It was like someone, it, came, it was like a, a giant showed up. I was like, hey, how, how are things going? Listen. And then it grabbed my emotions out of my body and then just started absolutely wailing on them. So, I've seen this film multiple times. This is not my first or second. I think this is my fourth viewing overall. I've seen it before. I'm no, it it still made me cry. <laughs> it still got me. I still had to pause the film and get up and go and wash my face. <sighs> God damn, Pixar! How do you do this? I mean, I know the answer. Careful, considerate, care. When you really work hard in a team of talented people to produce something that is just really, really good. These are the results. God, I, I really did. I, oh, my God. <laughs> like I said, no shame. No shame. It's like it's like mainline Nintendo games, you know? Why, are, why is Super Mario Odyssey so damn good? Because care, consideration, careful effort. You know, because they poured themselves into it. And God, you can tell. Holy crap. Married life. <sighs> no dialogue. First and foremost. Most important part of it. Everything has to be done without dialogue. Probably the best overall part of the film right there is the fact that there is no dialogue. Um, we see... <sighs> we see how what he does... Uh, what he, we see that the two made it work. We see that the two actually make take effort and try to make the relationship work, we see um, the contrast between the two of them 
which is portrayed in their aesthetic styles and how they like to sit and how like they like to move. But it's portrayed as a good thing. It's a Tetris thing. You know, they fit together, right? Like, like we'll talk later on this year in, in Rocky. They, they, they complement each other. Um, we see the balloons. The balloons are holding up the thing and pull it up. And he has to, oh, he has to stop it really quick. And that's his job that he goes to in order to, you know, make this happen. Um, there's a great bit where he sits down and he, and he just reaches out a hand to grab her hand and she reaches out to grab his hand. And you're thinking, what's so great about that? Both of them are engrossed in their books and are not looking at each other. You, I, I'm going to fail at explaining this. You know, I, I know that everyone's different. But you're really, really comfortable with someone when you don't need to fill the time or the space with anything. When you can just be with that person, and that's enough. I've seen that before. I have felt that before. It's rare from my experience and from my observations. But that's what they demonstrate with this simple thing. They don't need to be all lovey-dovey, though they are. Instead, they simply need to be with each other, and that's enough. Um, they see a baby in the clouds and that then cuts to them designing the baby room and there's energy in how they move. They're excited. Uh, the camera angle is kind of down looking up as if from a child's perspective. We see uh, bright, uh, you know, colors and it's in the whole room is very well lit. Camera then pans to the right, and in one smooth transition, we are now in the hospital, which is the exact opposite of everything I just said, except for the camera angle. Camera angle is still, still down here, but it is dark. The colors are desaturated. There's only lighting showing one little part of it, and it's them, and she is sobbing as, they're t as the doctor's talking to her. No need for dialogue. We know exactly what we're seeing right there. We don't need specifics. I, I should clarify. We don't actually know <sighs> exactly we know enough. They can't have children. For whatever reason. Let's be honest. The reasons don't really matter. What matters here is the fact that that thing that they very much want is no longer available to them. This then cuts to him trying to reach out to her by earning, a, uh, earning up for a trip. They get the jar. They put it out there. They start putting quarters and little pennies and nickels in as they go by. And it, it, it's just such a wonderful visual representation of the, not just the dream, but the dream as dreams should be. Dreams don't just suddenly happen and a magic genie shows up and fulfills it. No, what we instead see is how dreams work in real life, where you slowly, carefully work your way up to that dream and then make it happen. You'll notice all of this is extremely believable, grounded and down to earth. I think this is one of the reasons it hits me so hard, is because... Other than the stylized visuals, this just could be real life. At least for this part of the film. So, speaking of earning up for the trip, well, car, the, the tire on the car breaks. And then he needs surgery for his leg. And then the house gets damaged by the falling tree. And each one of these gets to a point where they have to be like, okay, you know, we have to let go of this. We have to let go of the dream in order to deal with the now. But then they go back to earning up again and filling the jar up again. Each time, the ties, the different ties that he wears, that could mean a lot of things. But as always, I, like I said, throwing the rest of it out, this is just my analysis. Each tie was selected by her. Her adding that variety and that spice to his life. He's a bit straight, you know, almost dour, I would say. But, you know, someone who you might otherwise call boring, despite his heart. She is someone who is far more, ah, again, how they fit together. So he goes out in the same outfit every day, except she changes his tie every day. Different tie, different day, different spice. It's just yet another way the two fit together. There's this enduring love the two have, and it shows them being very, very happy. Which is important because this is about when the jar starts to be less important. You'll notice that it's still there, but it's less filled up, and they don't need to go into it anymore, and they don't show anything about them actually putting into it anymore. With that, we are now shown exactly how much the two really mean to each other long term. It's one thing to love someone. It's another thing to love someone for years. 
and it is yet another th thing to love someone for decades. This enduring love is something that is beautiful, as it is shown here. They're happy. They don't need that jar anymore. They don't need the dream it posited because they have found something that's actually better. He, however, wants very badly to give her one last adventure as they're both winding down in the twilights of their years. And so he goes out, reaches into his saving, pulls out the tickets, invites her up on the hill, the same hill that they've been going to since they were kids. She doesn't make it all the way up the hill. She basically falls over, and thanks to the camera angle, this then shifts her falling into, metaphorically, not literally, the hospital bed. He's sitting there with her, of course, and once again, no dialogue. She just pushes the book into his hands. I'm not going to make it, is what this says. I'm not. This is the end. This is yours now. Live. This leads to an empty funeral and segues smoothly into an empty home. Forgive me for gushing yet again. This is cinematic brilliance. Two hundred and fifty four seconds. <laughs> this leads to our first major tone shift. Now it's after. Everything is quiet, dour, slow. A very long establishing shot of him going down the staircase, which is necessary. Uh, you know, it, it feels like padding, but it's absolutely not. It is very much establishing the tone here. He runs through the the paces. He goes through his exact routine that he always goes through. And he also refers to Ellie as a house. Or Ellie, the house as Ellie. Flat out calls her that. In fact, he does that throughout the film. Uh, the mailbox. the And, and yeah, he, he consistently he says, what am I going to do now, Ellie? And he looks up at the house. The house will usually show a picture of her when he says that. You know, the camera shifts up into the house and we see the picture of her up on the wall. <sighs> Naturally, we have a real estate conflict here. I mean, we all know real estate people are basically the bad guys, right? That's why you should vote for me in the election that happened last year from your perspective. Now, um, I wonder who's going to win. Like, there's, no, there's not even polls at the point where I'm recording this at, so I have no idea. Anyways, <clears throat> so. Uh, the kid comes in. He's got the, the sash of badges. How many of you did that? I was actually really into that, but scouts were uh, expensive and there were issues, so I didn't do that that much, so I made it my own, which is pretty much my approach in general. That's, that's kind of how I do things. Oh, I can't make this work. Fine, I'll do it myself. Drag, 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 and here I am recording videos on YouTube for you guys for a living. I'm not even joking. This is how I approach most of my life. I would imagine several of you had did the badges thing as well, too. Oh no, don't deny it, because you've probably gone looking for achievements when it comes to video games, haven't you? It's the same general concept. No shame. Again, it's it's fun. You know, it's fun to do. Although, that's the catch for me, if I might be so bold, especially when it comes to video games in particular. Achievement hunting has to be fun. If you have an achievement for running a circle for two hours, that's not fun. If you have an achievement for defeat this exceptionally hard boss with an additional restriction, which makes it even harder, that's fun. <laughs> so, kids talking it out, blah, 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 you know. Um, this leads to the most horrifying part of the film. Uh, a guy, completely by accident, by the way. It, this is important. Tone is so important here. They establish that the construction workers are nice folk. 
It's the guy in the suit who's villainous. Shut up. He, he's, he, he noticed the guy in the suit actually has no dialogue in the entire film. He just, in fact, he not only has no dialogue, he's got the shades on the whole time. So you don't even see his face or his eyes. He is dehumanized by both elements, which is good because he's the villain. No, seriously. He wants this land for his construction project. He doesn't care what he has to do to do it. Even if he has to kind of shift around legality in order to go after him. Now, let's be clear. What happened was a thing. One of the construction workers, who's a nice guy, accidentally knocks over the, the mailbox. Now, Carl flips out and goes to help, and the guy's like, no, let me help, let me help. Carl actually hits him with his cane. Now, you might think, oh my god, he hit him with his cane on the head. This is actually really, really, really low-tier stuff. Uh, if you actually shoved someone hard enough, you would literally be more assaulting someone than what he does here. The only reason it even draws blood is because it's a head wound. And the only reason anyone made any big deal about it is because the boss is evil, as I mentioned earlier. But this is all still amazingly grounded and believable, despite the stylization, despite the aesthetic. This is all still still stuff I could see happening in real life. I've met construction workers quite a few in my life. They tend to be pretty affable folk. And pretty helpful, too. I've met business people who are only interested in trying to procure land in order to put something else on it, too. They tend to not be cool. And someone deciding to use a, an extremely minor incident like this in order to drag someone to court, effectively against their will, in order to charge them with criminal activity, in order to show that they are no longer capable of taking care of themselves, in order to be able to take their house? Completely believable. This is all still very realistic. Which I point out because this is the most terrifying part of the film for me. Not the part where they're dangling from a dirigible you know, hundreds of feet in the air. Not the part where they're being shot at by, by, by planes or anything like that. No, it's this part right here. You know why? Because this could actually happen. It probably has, and probably does. When my sister and I were first watching this, this is when I stopped the film and said, Nope! Nope! That's my limit! <laughs> too real, too much, I'm out. We ended up heading out. I don't remember where we went exactly. We got food. We got lunch. And the whole time, we're just chatting, and she's trying to convince me to give it another shot. And thats I needed that. I needed that break from that, because it, it, was, it was just too real. You know, it's like writing a Dilbert cartoon. It's not funny when it's just, yeah, yeah, no, that's happened to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I could see that happening to someone like me. Right? It's, it's just, it stops being funny at a certain point. But she convinced me, and we came back, and we started up again. Which, ironically, is the exact moment the tone shifts for the second time. We enter the second of the tones. Whimsy. This is when the film's premise finally comes into display. He pulls out a bunch of balloons, lifts up the house, and leaves. Which, as anybody will tell you, is actually complete and utter nonsense. But that's okay, because... One of the things Pixar and several Disney films tend to do very well is have have a rule, basically. Okay, everything's completely like real life, except dot, 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 right? Now, this is, uh, it, it's, it's the what-if scenario. What if everyone actually breathed methane instead of oxygen? You know, it's, it, you, you have real life, but you change one thing, and you lead to this scenario kind of approach to storytelling, right? Very, very common. The catch is it's harder to do that and make it work than it sounds. Um, smarter people than I have analyzed this exact concept, but to put it simply, the what-if has to make a degree of sense in and of itself. It has to follow its own rules, and if it doesn't, then it just kind of breaks apart. And it and that then it breaks apart even more when you try to apply more believable rules to it, because again, the whole point is real life, but with one little alteration. So the idea of these balloons actually lifting this house is total nonsense. But the way it's established and the way it's presented very quickly and efficiently over the next few scenes establishes those rules I mentioned. Once those are established, we now have the basis for how they're going to approach this. And we're willing to go with it for the rest of the film. Also, to be completely blunt, I imagine that several people are willing to go with it just because the, the lead-up to this part has been so damned bleak that fine, fine, balloons lift the house, let's go. 
they actually did the math on how many balloons would be t it would take to lift the house. It's a lot more by a factor of, uh, let's see, that would be 10, uh, that would be 1,000, 10,000, yeah, by a factor of about 50-ish thousand mo times, times more balloons than they actually showed. They actually considered animating that and going ahead and having that many balloons. Then they looked at that and said, no, no, let's not kill our computers. So they decided to bring it down a little bit to the number that we actually show, which actually varies depending on the scene, which makes a lot of sense. Anyways, so he takes off. I mean, I can mention how the foundation is gone, so the house should completely fall apart. I, sh I can mention all sorts of things, but I don't care. We got the rule, okay? It's basically a blimp at this point. It is treated in effectively every way as a blimp. The way they drag it along the ground, the way that it actually kind of go, move, moves and sways with the wind, the physics of it. If you treat it like a hot air balloon or something similar, it is, it is very close to being one to one. Okay. Rule established. Let's go. So. Poor, poor Russell. Oh my God. He's just, actually, before we talk about Russell, there's this bit where he sits down in his chair, the one that's next to her chair. And he settles into it, and he smiles. I only point that up because it's the first time he smiled since the intro. If I was really horrible, I'd be like, so this is what he's imagining while he's in the old folks' home. But I'm not really horrible. He's in a freaking flying house. We're just, we're just going to go with it, okay? So anyways, poor Russell is stuck out there. Can I please come inside? Please? <laughs> he's very polite. This is his first role, if I'm not mistaken. But anyways, I, I want to add something here. It is harder than it sounds to add a child character, you know, a young character, to a work and not have them be irritating. Because most people don't know how to write children, and so they either write them as obnoxious, like Jar Jar Binks. I'm not necessarily saying that Jar Jar Binks is awesome or terrible, but he was written to be an obnoxious child, so there you go. Or they're written in the exact same manner that adults are. So he's just a tiny adult. Here, he's written extremely well. He also comes across as, this is another very key distinction, childlike or um, young, however you want to call that, instead of childish. Childish doesn't actually mean anything to do with the actual age. I have actually met more people who are in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s who are childish than I have actual kids. So removing the childishness from a child character is actually, in my opinion, very important because that does a huge part of getting rid of the irritation and annoyance of such a character. So he's polite, he's helpful, he just wants to, you know, do his thing. So then the ship, <clears throat> the house keeps going. That's fun. Uh, I'm going to fast forward a little bit. There's some good stuff here. Uh, we establish a lot of things, including the fact that his dad has to come to the ceremony if he gets this final badge and that his mom loves the Let's Stop Talking game. Also, there's the bit where he mentions Phyllis, who is not his mother. Now, Carl figures it out, but that is some damn good exposition. It's across four total scenes, and as the film progresses, we get a little bit more info on what Russell's, what Russell's home life is actually like. And while it's not the worst thing, I certainly have seen worse, Tangled, excuse me, it's not good. So, uh, they go, they find Kevin. Kevin's looking for food, of course. There's this really, really, really good bit. It's not even that subtle, where Carl is, you know, personifying Ellie as the house. And Russell kind of picks up on it like a kid will, because kids are smart and observant. Looks up and says, Ellie, can I keep him? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh, okay. Ellie says I can keep him. And Carl's response, without even hesitating, is, I told him no! And then he catches himself. And then turns to the kid and says, I told you no. That's actually very important, because for all intents and purposes, that house is Ellie to him. And well, I, that, that can be very unhealthy. <sighs> can be. So, Kevin goes looking around for food, we see Doug, we see the squirrel. You'll notice Doug is completely different from all the other dogs we see later, by the way. Different style, different approach, different species. They did a lot of research on dogs, because this is Bexar, of course they did. And so they established a lot of the dog dialogue and a lot of the dog animations based on real-life dogs. Go figure. 
I mentioned the the the, the Phyllis is my mom thing earlier. Russell. Russell, this is something I actually never caught before. I can't believe I never caught this. Russell says you have to go and you have to protect Kevin. Cross your heart. Now that catches Carl, so he says, "Okay, cross my heart." You know, because it reminds him of his dead wife, but also because he usually meant it when he said that. So, we are finally introduced to Munts, played by the absolutely amazing Christopher Plummer, who I'm just going to gush about for a second. Here, gush, gush, go watch Knives Out. Okay, we're done. <clears throat> Plummer. Huh. He's basically a Bond villain, isn't he? He's got his floating dirigible in his secret lair. He's got tons of food and resources somehow. And he's also got an entire army of minions, in this case, very domesticated dogs, who literally cook and serve for him. Wow, I, I don't even want to think about how the heck that's possible. As with the, the house thing, I'm just going to go ahead and go with that and move on. Let's just, let's just move on from that. I'm trying to think how I want to segue into this, because the thing is, he's very affable. He's very polite. He's very helpful. It is not until Russell actually points out, hey, I've seen that bird. That looks like Kevin, that he starts to go, hmm. There's this scene where he knocks off the hats off of the shelf. You remember that scene? How many of those people do you think he murdered? Bonus question. Given the stylings and approach of the caps, very, very similar to Carl's own when he was a kid, how many of those people do you think were also fans of Mr. Muntz, just like Carl is? One last bonus question. How many of them do you think were actually here to steal his bird? What we are seeing is Carl. He is fixated. To the point of actual obsession. I don't I, I, I don't want to use that word because obsession is the word that's thrown around way too much. No, actual obsession. Actual fixation. The kind of thing that is pretty much by default an unhealthy thing for a human mind. He is clearly absolutely locked in on this thing and it has debilitated his ability to think properly. He is a pretty horrible human being. How horrible? He tries to kill a kid in this film twice very deliberately very casually too it's just kind of a thing it's all right whatever kill him yeah nice guy but what really struck me and i said i never noticed this before was all of this would have been resolved if carl had just told him everything he knew about the bird oh yeah there's this bird and it's over there but instead he acts all suspicious and that triggers the paranoia and that triggers the obsession and that triggers the enemy okay why did he have to do that now, I know you're thinking, Laura, you're an idiot. How did you never notice that? And I don't know how I never noticed that before. He defends the bird because he promised he would. He crossed his heart. He, he had to. This is two films in a row we're covering where promises are actually a major plot point. <laughs> so, this leads to the final tonal shift. We're not... Well, actually, we're not quite there yet. Sorry, sorry. Let me rewind for a second. Um... Carl, Carl lost Ellie, but he never let go. Now, that's fine. Uh, I mean, if, as strange as that may sound, it's not like it's like, well, dead wife, moving on. No, no, no. The, the healthy human mind needs to grieve. And that takes time, and that takes effort, and that takes work. But it does, part of the grieving process is moving on. And that is exactly what Carl has not been doing. Every time he refers to that house as his dead wife, he is reinforcing not moving on, digging his heels in, literally, but also figuratively, and emotionally stagnating. This is exactly what Muntz has done for however many years down here, absolutely refusing to move on or change and in, fi in fixating on this. He has developed so many amazing things. He could go back and be a celebrated hero, an artisan who, is, who could lead a whole new era, but no, because this is what matters to him. Again, obsession, actual obsession. So, the house gets caught on fire. He breaks his promise. He calls Doug a bad dog. By the way, oh my god, Doug's reaction to that. 
Ooh. Oh, that... I don't even like dogs in that herd. But he finally does. He says, I'm going to do this even if it kills me. Takes the house. Drags it to the spot. I know that I tend to... Be, some of my viewers tend to make fun of me by saying I am obsessed with suicide. Yeah, but no. Um, this is when Carl's plan, as it was originally intended, is made full circle. He goes back into the house, and he sits in his chair next to his dead wife's chair. And he just sighs. Because he did it. This was it. This was the final act. He is here. He accomplished what he promised he was going to do. End of story. And that would be the end of his story. I don't think he would shoot himself or necessarily just sit there and dehydrate to death. He, he has food. He has resources. But that's it. There's no after. There's no end game there. So he, he was going there to die quietly alone, one way or the other. He pulls out the book. And as he's going through it, he just there's, you can see the grief all over his face. You'll notice that once again, damn it, once again, one of the best scenes of the film has no dialogue. But as he's turning the page, he, rec he sees something that he'd never seen before, because he never actually turned to those final pages. Things I want to do someday. Or stuff to do, I think is actually what it said. The future, all those things. I'm going to fill it with all of my adventures. It's pictures of them. It's pictures of them growing old together. It's pictures of a lifetime of happiness. Thanks for the adventure. Now go have a new one. Ah, oh, I can't even talk right. And I have no liquid. Of course, I have no water. I have Dyquil. I have Dayquil. There we go. I'll take some Dayquil. This will be my drink. <sighs> Thanks for the adventure. Now go have a new one. I talk a lot about obvious subtlety. Something that's not actually subtle, it's just brilliantly obvious in how it's portrayed. He literally unloads the excess baggage. He literally empties the house of all the crap he doesn't need or want anymore, and the house lifts. And the animation rules change. This is bloody brilliant. Because what they do is they change the rules in the animation for him for, for the rest of the film from this point onward. All those things I talked about that limited his movement and made it so he couldn't move his arms or he had to, you know, turn his body and all, all that stuff, that's gone. Now he's animated completely differently. God, that's just bloody brilliant. I love this film. Excuse me. So, film, it goes up. And we enter the final encounter, the final battle. We've we got to have a final battle. And... I, I, I'm sorry, as usual, I don't actually have much to say about it. Oh, by the way, you notice he takes off his coat, too, so he's just got the shirt. Literally, literally removing his burdens. The dogs the dogs are easily defeated. Twice. Why? Because they're heavily domesticated. Of course, they're literally trained, very, very well trained, and a very, very well trained dog is going to do what it's told. And be very domestic, so effort, effortless to defeated. Then we have the old man fight, which is great. Ah, my back. Ah, oh, my arm. Ah, oh, my leg. Um, there's the bit where they do the call. Carl remembered the call of of the stupid Boy Scouts or whatever they're called, uh, Wilderness Scouts. I can't remember what they're called, and does it in order to indicate, hey. And Russell did actually demonstrate earlier in the film when he teared it towards, steered it towards South America that he knows how to pilot this thing. So he then pilots it towards the end. This, this is when all those Chekhov's guns go firing up. I'm not going to list them all. There's just tons of them. But the best part of all is Ellie kills Munts. You caught that, right? 
brilliantly subtle, if you could call it that, in how obvious it is. Because the house, he jumps out of the house, and the strings on the balloons practically reach out and grab him, prevent him from leaving, and then snap, and then he falls to his death. Now, you could say, oh my god, Ellie, that's dark and horrible. No, 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 no. This was Ellie saving her husband. I, obviously, it's not Ellie, it's the damn house, but God, I love that symbolism. And then the house floats down, and as we find out towards the end, it actually settles on the spot. But what we see is him watching the house go down below the clouds because he is saying goodbye to his wife one last time. Russell goes to the, uh, to the award ceremony. Guess what? His dad's still not there. His mom is. Carl is. The highest honor I have to give you. And we see some new memories during the credits. By the way, if you haven't watched the credits, uh, it's obvious, the, the last uh, the last shot of the credits, I can't remember what it is, it's, you know, the, you, you just see these pictures. And when the credits start scrolling down to up, you'll know that you, you can stop watching at that point. I only point this out, a lot of Pixar films do this. Uh, WALL-E is a great example of this. I know people have never seen the credit sequence of WALL-E, and so they completely miss on the story beats that are in the credits. But in this case, we see new memories here that they make with each other, and he ends up basically being the cool grandfather to Russell, and they they give all the puppies to the the retirees at the retirement home, and they go to watch Star Wars together, and they learn what a computer is together. It's all good stuff. It's all good stuff. This is a damn good film. It might not be a favorite of mine compared to others like the true greats of the of the pixars but this film can absolutely evoke an extremely powerful emotional reaction in me more than i would like to admit if i'm being honest i hope you've enjoyed my disconnected blubbering thoughts here guys i'll see you next time <laughs>